Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the class on First Timothy. Uh, before we begin class, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Shall I pray? Yes, thank you, Divya. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you, Papa, for your grace, your kindness in our lives, Father. We come to you uh, with expectancy, Father, that uh, you will teach us, Father, from your word, that you will give us the grace to obey, Father, Lord. Now, though it was written uh, so many years ago, Father, we know uh, these scriptures are still relevant, Father, Lord. We need uh, your word, Father, to guide us, to be a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our paths. Father, Lord, we pray, Lord, you empower us with the Holy Spirit uh, that we can, uh, Father, uh, be an um, example, Father, be a salt and a light uh, to this world, Father. Especially praying, Father, for Pastor Selena, equip her, empower her, strengthen her, Father, Lord, that uh, she be able to teach, Lord, what your Holy Spirit is inspiring her to speak, Father. And the very word she speaks, Father, we pray, Father, we, uh, be a blessing, uh, be a nourishment, Father, to each one as well as to her, Father. We bless her in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We bless every student here, Father, Lord. We pray wherever we are, Lord, how you meet us uh, at our points of needs, Father, Lord, and speak to us very personally, very intimately, Father. Give us a receptive heart. Uh, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' precious name. We pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Divya. Okay, so... Um... Last Monday, we were studying First Timothy chapter 2. Uh, we looked at uh, chapter Timothy chapter, uh, First Timothy chapter 2, verses uh, 1 um, to 10, where uh, Paul is, um, uh, you know, uh, writing to the church. He's saying how uh, men ought to pray. And then he says, um, he goes on to say how women uh, have to pray. And then we looked, uh, we stopped at uh, verse um, 9 and 10, where uh, Paul writes and says that women, uh, uh, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, uh, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Um, so we looked at uh, this verse, we studied this and also said that, you know, many of them have used this verse uh, to say that women should not wear uh, gold or, or pearls or costly clothing when they come to church. But uh, uh, we looked at the context uh, why Paul is writing this. The context he's writing this uh, is that, uh, you know, he uh, he's basically mentioning, you know, uh, you know, when he says that you should not, uh, you know, have braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. Paul mentions uh, uh, these adornments that went against the principles of propriety and moderation in that culture. So basically, he's saying that, you know, uh, dress appropriately so that, uh, you know, when you come to church, uh, you are not overdressed or underdressed, but, uh, you know, uh, and it does not call for inappropriate attention to yourself. And also it's not a uh, provocative. Okay. Uh, and the, con the other context is because, you know, women were very dominant in the society in Ephesus because of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the goddess that was worshipped there, Dinah. Uh, so they had uh, women who had an upper hand, a say in things, a sway over men, uh, would do things. Um, we would look at that in a little more detail uh, in some time. Uh, so that is why Paul is mentioning that, which means that it is only in the context of that church, Paul is not mentioning this in general to other uh, uh, churches. He does not write to the church at Corinth or he does not write to the church at Philippi, um, but is specific for the church at Ephesus. So we need to understand it in their cultural setting and why he's writing it specifically to the churches at um, uh, Ephesus. And we also looked at the rest of scripture that nowhere in scripture says that you know, women should was prohibited from wearing gold or pearls or braiding their hair or, or, or costly uh, clothing. 
Okay. Uh, we'll move on to verses 11 to 15. So can one of you please read verses 11 to 15, please? Anyone can read verses 11 to 15? Can we trust you? Yes, Asha, go ahead. When a woman learns quietly with all the submissiveness, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then ever, and then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor, yet she'll be saved through a childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Amen. Thank you, Asha. So, uh, you know, again, people have used this passage saying that, uh, you know, Paul says that women should not uh, uh, teach in church. They should, uh, you know, remain silent. They should not speak up. They should be submissive. Uh, but, you know, we look, need to look at this again in the context of, uh, you know, why Paul is writing this. Um, you know, so when we interpret scripture, we need to interpret scripture in the light of uh, uh, Paul's own uh, ministry practice in the context of uh, in which Paul is writing this epistle to uh, that specific uh, region, geographical region, uh, the churches there in that uh, place. This is specifically writing here to the churches at Ephesus. Um, and also we need to interpret this scripture in the light of the rest of scripture because we need to, whenever we interpret scripture, we always need to interpret it in the context of the entirety of uh, the whole scripture to see what other passages are saying, which throws light on uh, this passage or uh, the words uh, that we are uh, studying or looking at or wanting to uh, find or uh, 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 get a meaning for. So let's look at uh, Paul's own practice. Uh, now here he says, let women remain silent with all submission. I do not uh, permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be silent. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you look at Paul's uh, ministry, uh, his own ministry practice, we see that, you know, uh, we read in his other episodes that he writes, he mentions uh, names of uh, uh, various uh, women who are part of his ministry team. He thanks them. He uh, mentions about them, uh, which means that he is, uh, you know, uh, uh, he's 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 telling the churches that he's writing to uh, he's writing this letter to that you know it's not just a one man show but there are other people and they're not just men but they're also women and he's recognizing various people in his team uh, people uh, in various ministry positions uh, those who are involved with him in the ministry uh, uh, at all levels who taking on responsibility so uh, in Romans chapter 16 verses 3 and 4 he mentions about Aquila and Priscilla you know this husband and wife team uh, were part of his ministry uh, uh, and he recognizes them and we know that this couple you know do a wonderful ministry both of them Aquila and Priscilla they're also involved in the teaching in the church they have a church meeting in their home uh, so here is a woman who's teaching who's involved in uh, 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 in building up a church in ministry activities imparting to others as well uh, Romans chapter 16 verses 1 and 2 uh, we also see Paul recognizing a woman leader or a deacon uh, of the church, uh, and her name is Phoebe. Uh, in the same chapter uh, in the book of Romans, uh, chapter 16, verse 7, uh, Paul also recognizes a woman called Junia, who is a, a woman leader, and uh, Paul says she's a fellow prisoner and also someone who's respected by uh, the uh, other apostles and possibly you know, uh, she uh, she may have been an apostle um, herself. So here we see that, you know, uh, Paul is not intending to mean that women in general all over should not be involved in uh, the 
teaching uh, or in the ministry of the church, but he is speaking it specifically uh, to the church, to the women uh, at the church at um, Ephesus. Because if you look at his other epistles and letters, he does mention women who are part of his team, who are leaders, who are responsible uh, people. Also, when Paul talks about, uh, you know, the, uh, the membership gifts uh, in Romans chapter 12, you know, uh, the membership gifts of um, prophesying, serving, teaching, encouraging, uh, you know, giving generously, uh, leading, uh, showing mercy, which is all uh, the membership gifts listed in uh, Romans chapter 12, you know, uh, uh, we see that this is distributed across all believers. Uh, there's no gender specific uh, mention over there. There's no gen gender specificity that is mentioned in this uh, sun, but it is distributed across all believers. Even when the uh, uh, talking about the gifts of the spirit, which Paul writes to the church at Corinth in First Corinthians chapter twelve, we also see that uh, there uh, as well it's given without in any gender specificity. There is no specific gender that is mentioned. That is these, you know, gifts of the spirit is only for men, it's not for women, but it's just mentioned in general. It's given for all believers, the gift that the Holy Spirit imparts to all believers who desire to have that, uh, who, who desire to flow in the gifts of the spirit. Um, if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, verse 26, you know, uh, Paul uh, there encourages uh, all, all of them, all women and uh, men in the church to prophesy and teach. Uh, if you look, uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26, he says, What then shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation. Uh, but he says, you know, it's it's good that you have all of these things. You you know have a word of wisdom, knowledge. Uh, you know you have gift of uh, you you have a prophecy that you want to release. You 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 uh, want to interpret the tongues that are spoken. Well, that is fine. But he says, you know, you need to do it in a way that is in an orderly way that will build up. Uh, each other. So he's not saying, you know, um, hey, only brothers can do that and not sisters. But he says, what then shall we say, brothers or and sisters? That means even, you know, women uh, uh, were eager to prophesy, to share uh, what they have received when they come to uh, the church. So he's not stopping them in the church of Corinth. But, you know, he's saying this specifically, which means he's saying this specifically to the church at um, uh, Ephesus. Even if you look at the ministry gifts, uh, which is mentioned in uh, which Paul writes to the church at, at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter four verse eleven, you know the 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 ministry gifts that is the gifts of a, of being an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher is also given both to male and female, and there's no gender specific uh, uh, mentioned. There's no specific gender that is uh, mentioned there, but this ministry gifts is also given to both male and female. So if we look at Paul's letters, his writings to other churches, he's, we, we don't see him anywhere saying that, you know, uh, they should not uh, preach or teach. Um, but, you know, uh, of course, he mentions in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he gives specific instructions on when women prophets and those uh, giving a message uh, in tongues, you know, they must remain silent when they must speak up so that because there was utter chaos, everyone, you know, we knew the, uh, we know the church at Corinth uh, was so uh, eager for the gifts of the Spirit. They were flowing mightily in the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, they just, every time they met, they had a word of wisdom, knowledge, prophecy, you know, something to share. And everyone just wants to share it. There was no order. So Paul was writing uh, uh, that all of you can share. Uh, in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the same chapter in verses 28, 30, and 34, he gives specific instructions on how women prophets and those giving a message uh, must remain silent when they should speak, when they should uh, share. Which does not mean that he's saying that women should not speak or uh, teach, 
But uh, so if you look at other epistles, there's no hint or there's no way Paul uh, uh, mentions this. So this is not a, a, a general teaching that he is bringing about in the in the churches as an apostle. This is very specific only to the church at uh, uh, Ephesus. So let's look at why Paul is writing this uh, to the church at Ephesus. Uh, why is he saying this? Uh, you know, um, uh, so just before we look at that, uh, we need to know that, you know, sometimes Paul addresses certain issues in specific churches. For example, uh, you know, uh, he talks about uh, head covering of the women have to cover their head uh, to the church at Corinth when he's uh, writing to them. So in first the first letter of Corinth, uh, to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, he uh, mentions this, but in that same chapter, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 16, he very specifically tells them uh, that this sort of custom is not among other churches. That means this is what he's addressing is specific only to this church, and this is not something that this should be followed in other churches um, as well. But at the same time, you know, he goes on to, in the same letter, right in chapter 14, you know, uh, he where he's encouraging everyone, which is male and female, uh, to exercise the gifts of the Spirit, which is prophesying, teaching, uh, speaking in tongues, and interpretation of um, uh, tongues. But then, of course, he goes on to specifically mention when they need to be silent, when they have to speak up. That is uh, in chapter 14 of the same letter to uh, to the church at Corinth in verses 28, 30, and uh, 34. So, um, you know, similarly, when we look at what Paul is writing here, we need to keep in mind what is the context. Why is he saying this? Why is he writing this to the church at Ephesus? Why is he telling Timothy uh, that women should keep silent in the church? Uh, it's because, you know, um, uh, the context, the cultural context is that the, uh, the, the city of Ephesus, uh, the people worship this goddess Dinah. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, everything in that in the city uh, centered around this goddess. So she was the center of everything. You know, uh, their expression of their culture, their emotions, the way of doing things, uh, their laws, everything, you know, uh, was uh, centered around this cult, uh, Dinah, this goddess that they worshipped. Uh, so from this book, I Suffer Not as a Woman, uh, we get a few details, uh, you know, about what was the cultural practice of um, uh, 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 you know, uh, the people at Ephesus, even as they worship this, uh, this uh, 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 you know, goddess Dinah. So, you know, um, uh, uh, because it was a female goddess, so they had female priests. Um, and, you know, these female priests, uh, you know, they promoted blasphemous ideas about sex and spirituality. Uh, and they also performed rituals in which they, uh, you know, they basically uh, pronounced curses on men and uh, uh, by which they declared female female superiority. So the, the women wanted to be superior because of this goddess. And um, uh, so they want to show their superiority over uh, uh, men uh, and hence they pronounce curses and uh, you know they kind of brought in this culture where women are uh, uh, are superior and um, they had uh, uh, you know uh, 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 authority over uh, men so you know most likely uh, when Paul was writing this to the church at Ephesus uh, he's saying that uh, you know I don't want these women who've come now from these pagan cultures uh, you know they've accepted Christ. They're part of the church now. Uh, he says, "I don't. Uh, I won't allow women to teach these cultic heresies." Uh, uh, you know, uh, in the church, uh, through which they can still, you know, uh, bring about female superiority over uh, the men, and they try to take over authority over men uh, by performing these, uh, uh, you know, these uh, uh, rituals, uh, these, uh, 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 and pronouncing curses. Uh, but he's saying the order in the church is that, you know, uh, there are men leadership, uh, men will teach, and in the light of uh, the cultural setting, uh, 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 but uh, uh, in the life of cultural setting and the order that is in the church, he says the order in the church we follow is that men 
uh, are leaders, men will teach, and women, uh, you know, have to be submissive, they have to yield to men, they have to yield to uh, uh, their authority, listen to them, and in that context, you know, uh, Paul is saying, uh, uh, reminding them that, you know, they have to remain uh, silent in the church, uh, and uh, they cannot, uh, uh, you know, assume authority over men uh, by performing these pagan rituals and also bringing these cultic uh, heresies or these false teachings uh, into the uh, church. And then Paul goes on to remind them, you know, uh, man's uh, headship in the government order of uh, 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 the home, the family, and also in the uh, church. Now, if you remember, you studied the house of God uh, in the first year, First semester, uh, and uh, we uh, we saw that you know God has uh, organized, uh, designed uh, you know a governmental structure uh, in the family, uh, in the church, uh, in the workplace, and it's important that we uh, you know submit to the uh, or even in the in the civil government, and it's important that we submit to the authority uh, that God has instituted, the governmental order, the structure that He's instituted so in the home uh, you know uh, uh, the man is the head and uh, the women has to respect the man and submit out of their love for uh, uh, Christ so uh, so the issue here with the women was hey you know uh, we are superior you know we come from this uh, uh, in the culture in Ephesus is women are superior we are superior over men we have a say uh, uh, we have authority over them uh, so the issue for them was when they come to church is you know submitting to uh, male authority listening to their uh, to the leaders who are male and also to their teaching uh, and so in the light of that cultural uh, teaching on the superiority of women uh, Paul is basically reminding them of man's headship uh, in God's government and uh, he's he mentioning here in this verses that uh, you know Adam was formed first and then uh, Eve was formed and then he says that Adam was not deceived but woman being deceived fell into uh, transgression transgression which the uh, which uh, does not mean that uh, you know uh, uh, that uh, that that male or men, uh, the male gender or men were not deceived or they're not easily deceived. It's only women who are deceived. He's not saying that. What he's basically uh, saying is that, you know, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, it was um, the serpent uh, we read in uh, Genesis uh, uh, chapter 3 where the serpent directly spoke to Eve and lied to her, twisted the truth, and she was easily deceived. Okay, and uh, you know she took the first bite, and then you know the serpent did not have to deceive uh, Adam because when uh, Eve passed on the food to Adam, you know he ate it without questioning, and hence both sin, both fell. Uh, so here it's not that you know man will not be deceived, man cannot be deceived. That is only women who are deceived so women are uh, the the fallen race and uh, the male gender not the fallen race no this is not what paul is directly saying uh, and it does not imply that women are more easily deceived than men but what he's simply stating here is the truth of the events that happened in the, the sequence that happened you know uh, eve was easily deceived uh, uh, you know, by Satan, and she just took the first bite. She gave it to Adam. You know, he didn't resist. He didn't uh, stand by what God told him to do. Uh, he easily gave in, and hence, you know, uh, Eve, uh, Satan did not have to uh, tempt him. So, uh, and he just ate the fruit. So both disobeyed God, both sinned, and both fell into transgression, which means both uh, sinned against God. Both fell into. Uh, sin. And then he, Paul goes on to write and say that nevertheless, you know, she will be saved or preserved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love and holiness with uh, self-control. So basically the word saved here, uh, you know, is that women will be kept safe or preserved during childbirth. Uh, we look at this in the light of what is written to us uh, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, uh, when God uh, 
you know, punished Adam and Eve and the serpent. Uh, he said to the woman that, you know, uh, you know, your great will be your pain uh, during a childbirth. But, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Paul is saying that even though, you know, uh, this punishment is there on women, uh, but yet they will be uh, saved. They will be preserved during uh, childbirth. And the word saved here uh, in the Greek is the word sozo, uh, which is an all-inclusive word for the word salvation. Uh, so uh, the, the Greek word for salvation in the New Testament uh, is sozo, and it's found uh, more than 110 times. Uh, and this word sozo is a very comprehensive word. Uh, which includes, uh, you know, not just, uh, it includes spiritual salvation, uh, which is um, forgiveness of sins, healing of sicknesses, deliverance from every uh, work of evil work of the enemy, uh, rescue and preservation from all harm and danger, uh, and total wellness, total wholeness and well-being of that person. So uh, the word salvation, uh, uh, the Greek word sozo is a very comprehensive word. It's a fully pregnant word, so to say, you know, which means uh, forgiveness of sins, healing from sicknesses, deliverance from every work of the enemy, rescue from uh, 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 or preservation from all harm and danger, and total well-being, total wholeness of that um, person. So sozo basically means to be saved, healed, delivered, rescued, preserved. Uh, it means all of these things at the same time. Uh, and it's a verb, it's an action word, uh, something that uh, is done to us, something that happens because of the work of Christ, because the full, sufficient, perfect work that Christ has done on the cross, uh, we receive uh, this sozo. So sozo also means that we will be saved out of the devil's power uh, and be restored into total wholeness, uh, you know, um, under the power of God's spirit, under his power, his authority, uh, we receive all of these things. So that is what Paul is, uh, uh, Apostle Paul is mentioning here, that even though women, you know, you would have, this is that punishment that occurs upon you, that you would have great pain in childbirth, but he says you will be preserved, you will be saved. Uh, he's talking about the word sozo, which means you'll be rescued, uh, you will be uh, saved. Now, why is you know, uh, Paul uh, mentioning uh, about childbirth uh, in this context, when he's talking about prayer and he's writing to the church, why is he talking about about women and childbirth at this time? Again, uh, you know, uh, this verse 15, we need to understand it um, both in the biblical context as well as in the uh, local context, the biblical context, as I already mentioned, Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, the fall of man, uh, where, uh, you know, God pronounced this curse, the punishment on women, uh, that they will have great pain during ch childbirth. Uh, so that is the biblical context. What is the local context or the cultural context? The cultural context is also important for us to understand. Uh, again, coming back uh, to the cultural context that of uh, the goddess Dinah, um, in Latin, she's uh, the, her name is Dinah, but in Greek, uh, the, uh, the name is Artemis, and she's the god of the opposites, the goddess of the opposites. Sorry, uh, and you know she was considered as someone uh, by the people who was uh, somebody who would protect uh, or support uh, you know uh, women during uh, childbirth. So she was a protector of women during labor pain during childbirth. Uh, but it's also said that, uh, you know, uh, Artemis, you know, that's why I said goddess of the opposites, Dinah and Artemis, you know, when uh, you get angry, uh, you know, it was said that the arrows of Artemis uh, brought sudden death uh, while a woman was giving uh, birth. So, uh, so this goddess was a divinity uh, of uh, healing, but also someone... Uh, who was, you know, who brought sudden death while giving uh, birth. And also if uh, if she would get angry, you know, uh, she would spread disease like leprosy, rabies. Uh, so, you know, in the context of the local setting, the, the cultural setting, the cultural uh, influence that the, of the worship of this 
uh, of Diana that uh, that people had on themselves, they were afraid, you know, during childbirth. But you know uh, what Paul is writing here and saying that because they believe in Jesus, because they have received salvation, because they're part of the family of God, they're part of the church, you know, they belong to Christ. Uh, that you know, uh, these women who believe will be preserved in childbirth. So this this whole uh, cultural influence, this whole understanding of this goddess Dinah, uh, that who will help them and also will be angry with them, will cause uh, uh, death during childbirth, will put disease, you know, that can be removed for their mindsets because once they believe in Jesus, you know, all women who believe in Christ will be preserved in uh, childbirth or during um, childbirth and then you know just like uh, Paul writes for women uh, sorry for men he says women uh, you also must continue in faith love holiness and self-control so focus on um, these things like he says in the in the previous verses in um, in verses um, um, 8 to 10 he says you know don't your focus should not be on just you know dressing up clothes, uh, apparel that you wear, uh, you know the 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 things that you adorn yourself with, but you know your focus should be basically on godliness and good works. And here he says, don't focus on you know being superior to men, uh, you know uh, uh, taking on a leadership authority. Women, uh, sorry, don't focus on. Um, you know, uh, or, or live in fear about, uh, uh, you know, uh, what this goddess uh, can do to you. But uh, he's saying, you know, focus on these important things that is faith, love, holiness, uh, with self control. These are some of the things that women uh, should focus on and not focus on other things like uh, being. Uh, superior to men being authoritative wanting to teach wanting to receive the limelight but just be submissive and you know focus on faith love holiness with self-control okay so that is the end of uh, chapter two anyone has any questions yes say oh uh, sorry pastor mine is more of an observation uh, thank you very much uh, first time I'm actually understanding these last three verses. Um, my observation is that, you know, when Paul wrote this letter, he, I, I don't think he even had an idea that one day it will all be compiled as a Bible, a part of the books of the Bible. And then we, you know, we'll, we as Christians will be studying it because many Christian circles have actually taken this out of context and have implemented the fact that women are not supposed to um, be in ministry, they're not supposed to teach. There's some circle of Christians, but now, you know, throwing light on the biblical perspective and then more importantly, the cultural perspective. I think it's it's uh, it would be a great honor to anyone who is going to teach the word of God to go an extra mile to understand the cultural context of whatever text that we're going to be preaching on. I think it's good. It's a very good idea because I didn't know all these things you were talking about. Although I always knew that Paul was always very specific, specific when he talked about his letter. But when it came to this place, this particular passage, I still kind of struggled a bit. Uh, but thank you so much for opening up our understanding. This is very enlightening. Thank you very much, Pastor. Thank you, C. Uh, but having said this, you know, we need to still hold on to the fact that, you know, uh, you know, for example, I can be a pastor in church, a woman can be a pastor in church, but when I come back home, I follow the governmental structure uh, that is ordained by God at home. I don't boss around my husband or boss over my husband at home, but, uh, you know, I submit to his, um, uh, his, his authority. The same way I can be a pastor at church and I can, we can have, you know, a senior pastor who's a male uh, figure, uh, it, it does not mean that because God has called me to a pastoral role and I flow mightily in the gifts or I, I teach or preach, does not mean that I don't submit to his authority, but I do submit uh, to his authority, to what he says uh, out of reverence for Christ. So uh, 
the governmental structure and order still remains irrespective of, uh, uh, you know, even though we are not part of the cultural context of what is uh, uh, what people at Ephesus faced, uh, but we still have this governmental structure and order. Uh, which we adhere to, which we follow, and also when it comes to dressing, we as women uh, dress uh, in a in a proper way when we come to church, uh, not to overdress, not to underdress, you know. Uh, uh, and our dressing should be in a way that honors God, uh, and is not provocative and is not causing unnecessary um, uh, attention. Um, but just in a way that is honoring and pleasing God. So this uh, also we need to keep in mind. So there are people, there's there's some women who can go to an extreme and say, okay, this is just uh, the cultural context, so I can dress any way, uh, you know, uh, I can speak, I can teach, I can have authority over man, uh, because uh, in God's uh, uh, eyes, you know, male, uh, there's no male, no female, all are one. Uh, so I don't have to listen to my husband. I don't have to submit to him. Uh, you know, well, that is wrong. Uh, unless uh, he goes away from God's standard and is saying things that are not right, then we, you know, we make a stand. But, you know, uh, but even then uh, we act out of love. We submit out of reverence for Christ, uh, uh, you know, and do things uh, to honor God in a God-honoring way. Yes. So we don't go to the two extremes, right? Yeah. Good Thank you, Sai. Thank you, Ma. Thank you, Ma. Thank you, Sai. Anyone else has any questions, any thoughts, anything that you'd like to share? OK. Uh, if not, we would uh, uh, move on to First uh, Timothy chapter three. So can um, can one of you uh, quickly read clearly and loudly First uh, Timothy chapter three? Others can Bibles follow through, and uh, you know uh, after that we will just share. If you have anything that you know God spoke to you, anything that uh, you know just slept out of Scripture, anything that ministered to your heart, you could. Um, uh, share that after somebody reads for us. So can somebody please read First Timothy chapter 3, please? Shall I read now? Seven Timothy chapter 3. This is the faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of, one, of one's wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, less being puffed up with pride, he falls into the same condemnation as a devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. You want me to continue, Pastor? Yes, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one's wife, ruling their children and their own house well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for, them, for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The great mystery. These things are right to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write to you so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. 
and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in, in the world, received up in glory. Thank you, uh, Christopher. Thank you for reading uh, for us First Timothy chapter 3. Yes, uh, I'll leave this time open for those of you who like to share, you know, anything that caught your attention, anything that, uh, you know, that you just uh, were reminded of what you learned before or what God spoke to you. You just uh, come back afresh in your mind. Some, you know, some words or some phrase that just leapt out at you from scripture, you just like to share. Just open this time for those of you who like to share. Okay, Kennedy says, our lifestyle should be a testimony of what faith we confess and teach as leaders. Okay, thank you, Kennedy. Yes, Christopher, uh, sorry, uh, Charles, you had something to say? Yes, <clears throat> about verse 2. Verse 2 of chapter 3, First Timothy, a bishop must then must be blameless, husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach. Uh, I, when, the, when Christopher was reading, I was looking at that and I was like uh, trying to see how I am, like gauging myself on that on that scale of being blameless being husband of one wife temperate sober-minded having good behavior being hospitable but also able to teach so um it it, it has caught my mind afresh that i need to again consider myself and try to look at it though i might not be a bishop in a church but at this level, as an elder, as someone who is heading a, a group of people, like I need all these qualities. I need all these qualities so that I will be able not to. Even verse three continues, but for sure, all these qualities are very, very important to me. And I was like, I think I need to again get a piece of paper and write and start checking each quality. Uh, like, I ha do I have this? What is my relationship with alcohol and wine? What about my violence? Am I greedy for money? Do I sign things that are um, not proper? Like, you add a zero on a check, or oh, no. Uh, maybe you are writing, you are writing a refund, you are asking for a refund and you add a zero, things like that. So um, God was speaking to me and I think I'm going to put it in practice by doing a checkout so that I am able to understand my my standing currently. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. I think it's very humbling to hear that uh, from you. Thank you so much. You know, sometimes we, when we read scripture, we always think of others, you know, uh, other leaders. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's extremely difficult to just look at it and put yourself there and say, hey, do I have these things? Even though I might not be a bishop or a leader, but I am in full-time ministry. Uh, and just to act on it, uh, thank you so much. This is so wonderful to hear that uh, from you, which is so humbling. Thank you. Yes. Anyone else? Uh, Ma'am, I have a question. <clears throat> While we're reading the whole passage, we see that it is about the position of a bishop, and it is uh, basically talking about, uh, you know, a man. Uh, so mm -hmm. this position or this office particularly belongs because they're talking of one wife managing the household, managing children, uh, having a wife. So there is a particularly talking about only a man being given this position. Uh, this is my question. 
So you're saying, uh, should only men be bishops and deacons? That is what is your question? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. Again, we need to look at it in uh, the light of uh, the cultural setting and also in the light of the entire uh, scripture. Uh, it does not say anywhere that women should not be uh, spiritual leaders uh, because you know they are part. They they are given the membership gifts. They give the spirit. They uh, they are also called into various offices of apostle, prophet. We have prophetesses uh, in the Bible. Uh, 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 we have uh, leaders like Deborah who was a judge. Uh, we had, uh, you know, uh, also Philip's daughters who were, uh, you know, who were prophesying. Um, so, you know, uh, in that context, we see in rest of scripture that there were uh, spiritual leaders uh, who were women. But in this context specifically, yes, there were uh, men who were leaders uh, in the church. Uh, so Paul is, uh, again, you know, uh, uh, writing about, writing to men who are leaders and writing to Timothy, uh, uh, telling him what kind of leaders he needs to choose. Uh, as bishops who were the spiritual overseers and as deacons who were, you know, administrators, just uh, part of the local organization of the church. Yes. But uh, in today's context, uh, do we see uh, uh, women who are bishops? Yes. Uh, does God work through them? Yes. Uh, uh, in the Bible, do we see uh, women who are spiritual leaders? Yes. The Holy Spirit imparts to them. The Holy Spirit uh, uh, speaks to them, uses them uh, mightily. So, uh, you know, it does not mean that uh, in Scripture it says that anywhere it says in Scripture that women should not be uh, leaders or spiritual leaders. They were spiritual leaders. Uh, the Holy Spirit worked on them, especially uh, the Old and New Testament, we see, you know, how the Holy Spirit anointed uh, women, uh, Miriam, Deborah, Esther, Ruth, Anna, who was the prophetess, uh, prophetess uh, Philip's daughters, you know, uh, and even uh, in the prophecy that Joel uh, mentions uh, and what was quoted by Peter in his sermon in Acts chapter 2, he says, the promise of the outpouring of the Spirit is for your sons and daughters and both will prophesy. So yes, uh, you know, uh, women can also be leaders. But in this specific context, cultural setting, there were only men who were uh, leaders of the church. So he was talking specifically to them, uh, telling uh, Timothy how to choose uh, these uh, leaders. What are the qualifications that are uh, required? Kennedy says, I must keep hold of the deep truths and clear conscience more so on social boundaries not taking advantage of my flock. Yes. Yes, that, that's what uh, Paul mentions, faith and a clear conscience, faith and a good conscience, which is very, very uh, important. Because if you don't have a good conscience, you know, which is uh, which uh, which enables you to have a good conduct, you know, that will shipwreck your faith. Like he talks about Hymenaeus and Alexander, who's whose uh, faith was shipwrecked. And that's why he talks so much about maintaining a good conscience. Yes, thank you, Kennedy. Uh, Christopher? Uh, yes, uh, Pastor. I was um, I was just sort of reflecting on, you know, while I was, while I was reading. And um, I realized that, you know, I had, um, you know, I was, as I was going through it, uh, you know, I didn't actually read the headings or the first, you know, the first two paragraphs and then the great mysteries, the one I actually read, uh, I actually, um, you know, read, read out aloud. So I, uh, as I was just reflecting on that, I realized that, um, you know, Paul is now, you know, talking about, you know, this, this, uh, you know, Jesus as or God as the you know as the as the role model, uh, you know, for us, um, uh, you know, and he talks about this 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 mis this mystery, and um, again, as I was reflecting, there was two things. One is this role model. The other thing was I was just talking. I was just thinking through the mystery part, and um, uh, I was you know even as I mean as believers or even non-believers, you know, it's really about. You know, it's a mystery because it's it's also in the supernatural. You know, where we he's going through this, uh, you know, this um, uh, the sexual, uh, you know, where God uh, has has manifested in the flesh, and then you know he is um, uh, 
you know, again, he talks about justified the spirit seen by angels. And then he is also talking about received up in glory. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, that is really, you know, that is only, you know, possible by God. And that's why I think uh, Paul is talking about this being a mystery, because it's, it is something that is out of the ordinary and something that is not, uh, you know, of the world. Really, uh, it is something that, uh, you know, is supernatural. Yeah, so I, I was just, I just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? Any other thoughts? Anyone else like to share? Uh, verse 16 is gospel in uh, one verse. Yes, yes, true. Yes. Okay, uh, it's time for our break now. We'll stop here and then uh, we'll come back after the break and uh, we will do a detailed study of uh, First Timothy chapter 3. Okay, thank you everyone. See you after the break.